Hello and welcome to part one of my video lecture on stigma as a social problem. You may remember that in my welcome message, just walking you through the syllabus and walking you through the D2L page, I noted that um, my orientation to the issue of prejudice and discrimination against people with mental illness is the idea that these negative attitudes and behaviors actually constitute a social problem and a public health uh, crisis for us as a nation. And I'll, I'll attempt to, as I go through this semester with you, to, to build that argument and perhaps even convince you that I'm right as we go along. Now, the, the Stigma as a Social Problem video lecture is divided into two pieces. The first will be um, introducing you to the nature of the problem of stigma. Um, and, and then relating it directly to stigmatizing images in the media. Part two, we'll be presenting you with what I call a social cognitive model of mental illness stigma um, that builds on my experience and expertise as a social psychologist. Uh, you will probably find yourself returning to that second part of this lecture um, in order to use that social cognitive model in your film analysis paper. So you will want to, to remember that that resource is available to you. Before we go any further, we need a working definition of stigma. Um, you may have seen the classic definition of stigma if you are a sociology student or if you've taken uh, some sociology or anthropology courses. Um, the, the classic definition that I was exposed to as an undergraduate was Goffman's definition, where stigma is described as a mark, um, some sort of indication publicly that a person should be uh, eligible for, if you will, um, public shaming and public exclusion and public maltreatment. Um, it, it comes from sort of this, this archaic noted notion in some cultures where people would be physically marked, often on the face, with tattoos or scarring um, or some other symbolic marking, so that they could be recognized at a distance as being someone who is worthy of discredit, who is worthy of maltreatment. So what being a stigmatized group or being a person who is a member of a stigmatized group really means is that it's permissible within your cultural context for you to be rejected. And then there are all of the emotional components to that. It also gives people in your wider surroundings permission to be angry with you just for existing, to be fearful of you just because you're present, to pity you and to be disgusted with your appearance, with your just the fact that you're there. Um, so when a group, an entire group, is stigmatized, it really does give that, that kind of blanket permission for other members of the culture to, to treat those individuals with uh, abject disrespect. Being labeled as a person with a mental illness or being called mentally ill um, in our culture um, has long been a stigmatized group. Um, what we tend to see in the research literature, even in recent years where we are becoming more open, people are more conversant, they're more willing to disclose their mental health status, we continue though to see persistently negative um, attitudes in very specific domains, specifically our, our expectation that people with mental illness will be dangerous, but also that they will be largely unsuccessful in life. Those negative attitudes tend to be stuck to that category of mental illness like, like super glue. Negative attitudes and beliefs, in the social psychology world we call that prejudice, um, so, and that's a broadly applied uh, term that you can use when you're talking about racism, when you're talking about sexism, um, any kind of, of prejudiced grouping. Uh, so those are attitudes and beliefs. They may or may not lead to actual overt discrimination. And when we talk about mental illness stigma, what we're, we're really going to focus our attention on in 
this semester is the fact that people with mental illness face housing discrimination, they face employment discrimination, educational disparities, and violations of their civil liberties, uh, including voting discrimination and so on. Now, before I go to the next slide, I'll pause. Uh, my dog is in the room. She'll probably bark at some point. Apologies. As we start to think about the role of media here, um, I've asked you to read uh, Otto Wall's Media Madness text. And that text, although it was published in 1995, um, unfortunately, the situation really hasn't changed. So you might find as you're reading the examples that Dr. Wall provides for you about television programs are dated enough that you don't know what these shows are, or if he's talking about films, they may be older films. And you may be thinking, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this, you know what, a better example of that that he's describing would be this movie. Um, well, that's true. So a lot of his references may be dated, but the argument isn't. And that's disappointing, but it's a fact. So Dr. Wall argues that, and it, this is based on empirical research, and it's also confirmed by what my students have told me, when you ask people, where do you learn primarily about mental illnesses? Where do you find out about specific diagnostic categories? Where do you find out about uh, mental illness in general and the lives of people with mental illness? People overwhelmingly say fiction television. Second to that is advertising from drug companies. So when we look at television and film as a whole, uh, while it's typically doing a bad job of education, it is our primary source of knowledge. So as Wall indicated in your text, Americans do, and this was true in 1995 when the book was published, it continues to be true now. Um, most Americans identify the mass media, that includes television, film, print, radio, internet, um, especially as streaming services have become ubiquitous. That is their primary source of knowledge uh, about mental illnesses uh, and is the primary source of people's expectations, their beliefs about people who have either mental illness in general or specific categories of mental illness. Wall also, and this is in chapter two of your text, notes, and, and I've given you the full quote here because I really, really want you to remember it. Um, we are, and I say this a lot in my social psychology class, so if you've had that class, this will sound awfully familiar. Human beings are a narrative species. We tell stories. We love stories. How could we have things like podcasts if we didn't love stories? We, we thread our lives together, um, creating stories to tell ourselves and to tell other people. The words we use and the images that we hold in mind are things that reflect cultural attitudes, values, and beliefs. They also reflect our expectations of other people. As a result, our behavior, how we behave in response to other people, is shaped by those expectations. Again, my social psychology students from the past will go, aha, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So my beliefs about people with mental illness is gonna shape how I act if I find out that someone that I know has a particular mental illness. It's gonna determine whether I distance myself or I come closer, whether I'm nice or whether I'm resistant to interacting. Um, so our words, as Wall puts it, both mirror and influence how we treat people. Um, and that's regardless of whether the category that you're working with is mental illness or it's some other social category. What we, what we believe shapes the words we use and the images that we see have to be interpreted and they're interpreted in terms of those beliefs and uh, ideas that we've stored in memory. So as Wall puts it, this underscores why it's so critically important to think about words and images and how, what kind of impact it would have when those words and images are uncritically and inappropriately used. Now Wall also notes 
that there are some very common messages that we see in film. Um, and, and I kind of, when I say film, I, I kind of broadly include both film and television now. And by television, I'm also including streaming services. The landscape has really changed dramatically in the last decade, decade and a half, uh, uh, concerning how we get our, our films. It's not just in theaters, it's now also in a whole bunch of different domains that we can access on phones and tablets and computers. Regardless, the research is pretty clear. There are some common messages that we see in, in film media. Number one, um, the message that tends to be sent by films is that people who have mental illnesses, uh, whether they are specifically defined or if it's just a broad categorization, the message is that these are people who need to be controlled because they're dangerous. Um, the first film that we watched this semester is going to be Joker. Uh, it's a film you may have seen. It's a film that you may have enjoyed. I'm going to ask you to watch it differently um, this time around because it is, it is a classic, classic example of this problem. Um, I mean, there's an embedded, very interesting, compelling social message in the film, but the, at the end of the day, though, the message is ignore us the us being people with mental illnesses, ignore us at your peril because we are very, very dangerous when ignored. We also see common messages that communities of people need to um, punish those who have mental illnesses in one way or another, either by treating them badly uh, in their everyday lives or excluding them from things like housing and education, needing to keep them segregated into inner city domains where their services are supposed to be accessible um, or to literally lock them up. Uh, as we move through the class, I will speak about the fact that the major mental health provider in our nation is the criminal justice system. And I, I can't uh, state more strongly, uh, in any way more strongly, how inappropriate that is. But that's the case. So that echoes a message that we often see in films, that people with with serious mental illnesses in particular have to be um, locked up and in some way punished for what they do. There's also a common message in film and television that people with mental illnesses are just never going to get better, that the problems that they have um, don't respond to treatment, that the treatments are false, that they simply don't work. Um, and that's very problematic because it encourages people not to get the help that they need. It encourages their family members to see, to feel that there is no hope um, for what's happening. And then finally, there's a real strong tendency to present people with mental illnesses as not being able to do simple things. Uh, and sometimes it's a real clear uh, presentation of people with mental illnesses as being quite childlike, you know, not how, knowing how to purchase things or dressing like children, and sometimes been dressing like children from another era, like representing a, a very stereotypical way of dressing, uh, as if you were dressing in the childhood clothes of your parents, for example. Um, that's a subtle one, but generally speaking, people with mental illness are presented as just not knowing how to behave like an adult, even when they are fully adult humans. So to summarize, what are the, some of the specific perceptions that Wall and other researchers have identified in film and television that tend to be uh, presented in characters in those media uh, who have mental illnesses. The first and foremost is that these are people who are dangerous and violent and if left to their own devices, particularly if they're not strongly being treated or monitored or locked up, these are people who will hurt you and they will hurt you for no reason or for bizarre and delusional reasons. So the first and foremost finding of the research in this area is that characters with mental illness most likely are going to be presented as very dangerous people. The second, um, in terms of percentage, 
is that these are people who will have childlike motives or a whole pattern of childlike behaviors. Um, for instance, being um, having tantrums that are very childlike in quality. Um, in the most benign form is people have a very kind of pristine childlike perception of risk and, and danger. Some of the, the more interesting portrayals that I've seen since I started teaching this class is that you'll have this weird mixture of dangerous and childlike, and we'll see that in Joker um, very, very strongly. You have someone who just really wants the, the simple things in life to be connected, to have fun, to have joy, and can't cope with the simple things in everyday life, but at the same time is vividly and and dangerously violent um, in his behaviors. Incompetence, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with uh, childlikeness, where people make simple mistakes, they can't cope with problems, um, and they can't be successful in keeping jobs, in keeping housing, in keeping a relationship, or even starting a relationship. Unpredictability um, often comes coupled with dangerousness. So one of the, the factors that tends to pop up in these characters with mental illness is that their behavior is sometimes shockingly bizarre, but it's also something that the other characters in their atmosphere are surprised by, and they're surprised unpleasantly by their behaviors. Blameworthiness and malingering are sometimes harder to, to decode in film and television, but they do tend to appear. Blameworthiness tends to be in one of two forms, either in the form of the person, the character, him or herself, has done something like used drugs or broken the law or um, done something otherwise immoral that is then punished, kind of metaphorically, by giving them a mental illness. And if they stop doing those things, if they stop using drugs, if they stop breaking the law, then their symptoms will go away. We'll certainly see that when we look at the film Matchstick Men, where you have a person who is a, a con artist who is clearly hurting people and breaking the law in, albeit a funny way, um, he, he, the main character deserves to have all the suffering that he has because he's bilking little old ladies out of their money. So there's a kind of blameworthiness there. The other form of blameworthiness is in the bad behavior of the, ma the character's parents. It, and again, we'll see this in Joker very clearly. Joker is presented as having a very disturbed, uh, problematic mother there's no father in the picture, so you have two blameworthy elements in the, the main character's upbringing. He's also labeled as adopted, which is a really nasty, unpleasant element of stigma here. Um, I wouldn't say it's commonplace, but it happens enough that it warrants mention, where you'll have children of unknown parentage or problematic parentage who come into an unsuspecting family, they develop mental health problems, and they start to exhibit dangerous and bizarre behavior. So there's a stigma attached to adopted people who then develop psychological problems, and the expectation is that they will behave in an almost demonic way. Um, blameworthiness and or malingering the malingering piece, and if you're unfamiliar with that word, what it means is you're pretending to have a mental illness in order to garner advantages. It's not uncommon in television and film to have a character who fakes being a, a person with mental illness in order to get out of some kind of punishment or to reap benefits from, quote unquote, the system. Um, it's not quite as common as the other um, elements that I've already described here on this list, but it does happen, and sometimes it's woven into the idea of not being treatable that we'll mention next. 
So contagion and untreatability, you, you can probably think of if you spend a quiet moment, you know, rifling through all the movies you've seen and the television programs you've watched, there's a tendency in Hollywood, if a character, even a character of supposedly sound mind, goes into a psychiatric hospital, they won't come out uh, mentally healthy if they come out alive. So there's a tendency, especially in institution films, to have characters who go into that environment without a mental illness develop bizarre behavior while they're there and then either die while they're in the institution or when they come out they're permanently changed and they become um, the unpredictable, incompetent, dangerous, uh, stereotypical character that we all expect. The untreatability piece, the assumption is that, that people with mental illnesses simply don't get better. They may get better for a while, but you can never really count on it. They, these are people who at their core are unpredictable and they're likely to revert to their negative behaviors at some point in time. So you can't put your faith in them at all. Now what you're gonna have to be on the lookout for, um, and at the end of every uh, film reflection, I'm going to ask you to rate the films that you watch on a scale in terms of how stigmatizing they are. In part, what I want you to think about when you're making those ratings is how often do you see these six things, these six categories of attributes in the characters that are being presented to you? How often are the characters being shown to be dangerous? How often are they childlike and incompetent? How often are they unpredictable? Um, is there evidence of blameworthiness in the person or in their immediate family? Um, particularly look for bad mothers because that seems to be what Hollywood writers love to use is uh, mothers who have disturbing behaviors uh, that cause their children to literally go mad. Um, look for contagion messages and for untreatability. We can see these elements um, in classic films, and it, it's, it's as if from the very beginning of film, and there are even examples in silent films that you know we don't have a lot of good access to, but from the very beginning of film and television, from the beginning of literature, from the beginning of storytelling, we have been telling stories of um, people with bizarre behaviors that we would now label as mental illness particularly in the case of schizophrenia um, and multiple personalities, there are examples of this being used as a plot device to, to frighten us in the case of horror films or to titillate in the, the case of um, films that are dramas with just small elements of horror such as Psycho um, or in just straight dramas um, where we are baffled and terrified that we could be in the same position as Olivia de Havilland's character in The Snake Pit. Now there are more modern examples and just to, to give you a brief picture of just how ubiquitous these characterizations are and how often writers, whether they're writing for film or television or whether they're writing novels uh, or plays, just how easy it is for them to slip into this stereotypical pattern of representing mental illness in a particular way. Films like Silence of the Lambs, multi-Academy Award winning film, it's, an ex it's exciting, it's terrifying, you'll never ride an elevator the same way again after you um, watch the film, nor will you think about butterflies, moths, or Quixote in exactly the same way. Um, it's a highly stigmatizing film on multiple levels. Um, Fight Club, it, which has a cult following, it, it's by far not a perfect film, but the novel had cult following, so did the film, and it still does. Some of the most intense arguments I've had with students over the years have been over Fight Club, which, uh, let me say it again, just for the sake of argument, it's, it's a multiple, multiple personality film, dissociative identity disorder film, and it in no way is an accurate depiction of that disorder. Just if you're taking notes, underline that. It's not accurate. Neither is me, myself, and Irene 
um, which is a comedy representing multiple personalities. Now, I'm a big fan of detective fiction. I love crime. I don't know what that says about me, but I do. I, I read a lot of detective fiction, especially if I'm, I really want to just shut my brain off, not think hard, I read detective fiction. Um, there's a long-standing pattern in the detective fiction genre, especially from some of the most productive of these authors, meaning they have franchises, they publish a lot, they have employees who do lots of writing with them. Uh, people like James Patterson and John Sanford are, are prime examples here. In virtually every novel that they write in some of their major series, you have a person who has a mental illness of some kind, either labeled generally or labeled specifically, who goes on murderous rampages, or they are incredibly sadistic serial killers and they have to be caught. Um, by the protagonist in these novels. In television, you really started to see a shift in the way um, characters with mental illness were depicted with the advent of shows like Law and & Order and Crime Scene Investigation. Law & Order is still kind of a franchise that's going on, um, whereas you know CSI, I believe, um, is a closed chapter in television history, but both shows are still in their various incarnations are still widely available in syndication and, and on streaming services for people to watch. Um, what happened with these, they're called police procedurals, they're, they're started uh, somewhere in the, the late 1990s, um, a tendency to start including psychology and psychiatry language as a way of giving the audience an explanation for why people cr commit crimes, uh, particularly murders. And most of these shows really center on homicide and uh, they, they have gotten more and more graphic with time um, as time has gone on because you keep having to up the ante as a writer. In the Law & Order franchise in particular, what happened over the course of the series was they took this so seriously that they had to add a character. It was a recurring character, and you see it in each of the franchises, the, the spin-offs of Law & Order this and Law & Order that. Um, they've started to include a psych psychology or psychiatry expert that they can kind of trot out. Um, usually it's about at the half hour who gives the police officers who are trying to find the criminal, um, gives them kind of a mini profile. Uh, and it gives you, the viewer, oh, that explains why this person did such a horrible thing. They have this illness, they have this problem, and you can hang their behavior on that diagnostic label. And that's become pretty ubiquitous within this genre of television production. Um, CSI was a little less of that, but you still had major characters, even though they had no psychology background, spinning psych theories for the audience so that they could label um, what they were seeing and kind of put it with that category of these are weird things that people with mental illnesses do. Now, as we'll see in, in this class, film has not moved very far um, in terms of getting away from this habit of writing. Uh, characters with a mental health background, uh, meaning they have a mental health diagnosis, they have psychological problems, they're somehow tied to their background and their history as, as people. Um, and our first film, again, we're going to look at that uh, as, as something that is, is deeply problematic. When we think about television, and I'll refer you back to uh, Otto Wall's text, Media Madness, research on television images in particular has shown that um, when we analyze, and, and you know, the Wall and Roth study was quite some time ago, but I would wager if some of you are comm students, go and do the research. I would wager that if you picked a streaming service or you picked a live TV service, um, if you looked at people's uh, viewing habits and took a sampling 
you wouldn't see results that are all that different um, than what uh, Wall and Roth found. Basically, they found a fairly high density of characters that were presented as people with mental illness. I would guess that if we were to do this research today, we would find a higher density, uh, mostly because people have a false sense of uh, their own understanding of diagnostic labeling since the, the mid-19, uh, early to mid-1990s when the FDA changed the rules on advertising of psychotropic medications and we all get treated to a pretty steady diet of advertising that shares these labels, talks about what these uh, disorders do, and then you know tries to market drugs to treat them. So we all have this false sense that we know who these people are and what their problems are. Uh, so my guess is that the density would e even be higher. Wall argues that, you know, based on findings like this, the average person who spends time in front of a screen consuming uh, TV shows or films, full-length films, is going to see at least one character with a mental illness every time they watch. Um, again, you know, if you're a comm student, if you're someone interested in film and television, you could conduct this kind of research, either formally or informally, and find out. It's an empirical question. Now, I want to start, and, and I will say, if you have trouble, sometimes it's hard to capture embedded videos um, when I'm recording lectures. I will um, be posting separate copies of these embedded videos so that if the sound quality is poor, you can listen to them um, in, a, in a better quality. Here's what I believe is the single worst episode of television ever made in terms of stigma content. Hello and welcome to Schizophrenic Jeopardy! from controlling your brain. What is tinfoil? Correct, go again. Voices in my head for 300. Miranda, how much do you wish to bet? The robot king says 100. Okay, listen to these sounds recorded in your bedroom last night. Sorry. The answer was President William Howard Taft. 
William Howard Taft. Voices in my head for 200, Alex. Could you please stop sending me your filthy thoughts? Lately, they've been plotting to kill you. Julie? Freedom. Jamal. The artist formerly known as Sting. Okay, anybody. Lately, they've been plotting to kill you. Anybody? Who are Louis Tyler and Lester? That's correct, Stu. You can tell them all. You hear that, mother? God has chosen me to control this board. So things are going to be different around here. Oh, what? Well, that means it's time for final schizophrenic jeopardy. Tonight's category is... Gas. They're pumping in gas, and it's not the good kind. It's time for final schizophrenic jeopardy. You can't buy a ball, Stu. Stu, you can't buy a ball. This was an episode of television that was uh, from a program called Mad TV. Uh, it was originally airing in primetime on the CW, which is a defunct network. The, the prime target, the, the you know, target market for the CW was young, um, you know, trending young, urban um, uh, viewers at that time. Now, when this was filmed, this was before they were streaming. Netflix hadn't been invented, no Hulu, none of that. People had to kind of tune in when television programs were shown live uh, uh, on networks. Um, the difficulty, and you might see the little icon in the, the bottom right corner, this Mad TV, after cable, after um, even streaming services emerged, uh, Mad TV was syndicated and continued to be shown on Comedy Central for years, for several years. The clip that I've recorded here, I've recorded on VC VHS from my, my television set and then digitized so that I could show this particular episode. The makers of Mad TV had pulled the video from their YouTube page such that it couldn't be seen there. Um, so I, for, for educational purposes, I just wanted to show you this. This was something that writers came up with. It was a premiere episode with, at the time, a very popular actor, Christina Applegate, um, who, you know, I would like to think would know better now. But they spent a good chunk of time really kind of playing with this idea that wouldn't it be funny if we put people with schizophrenia on a show and systematically made fun of them. Now think about if you made this, and, and there are, you know, parody versions or um, social criticism versions of Jeopardy that show up on Saturday Night Live um, that, that we could talk about as well in a different context, but for this context in particular, it takes an entire category of people, people living with schizophrenia, and you can look at each of those stigmatizing elements, unpredictability, um, contagion, the the idea of mixing the diagnosis of schizophrenia with multiple personalities, which are not the same thing, uh, childlikeness, um, including you know living with one's parents, even though, as Stu puts it, his mother is dead, which is kind of an homage to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho that's built in here. So I would describe this as the single worst episode of TV that I've ever seen in terms of stigmatizing content really ask yourself what would happen if you were you know a writer a tv writer and you pitched the idea let's use do autistic jeopardy and make fun of people with autism uh, as contestants on jeopardy show knowing the stereotypes of people with autism you could write that episode of television but you wouldn't do it because it's not funny so you really need to ask the question why is this funny? 
why do people think it's funny and why do they think they have permission to laugh at people who have schizophrenia i was once uh, told by a, a student in the class who was i asked that question in class you know why is this funny and his response was because they don't know any different you can laugh at them and they're there and they won't know well part of that is an assumption um, and he wasn't saying that he would laugh at people with schizophrenia um, but you know the the comment is very telling there is an assumption that people with mental illness are stupid that they are unaware that they you can tell jokes about them make fun of them and they will be blissfully disconnected from anything that you say um, and besides they're crazy they really just it won't matter what we say about them they're crazy anyway and you know some of that is you know seeing them as childlike seeing them as stupid seeing them as ignorant um, the fact of the matter in real life people with mental illness is no way they stand uh, particularly people with schizophrenia and other serious mental illnesses that are attached to such negative stereotypes they know when they're being made fun of and it hurts it hurts them a great deal it also has real genuine harms in terms of their ability to get a job or their ability to get safe housing and so on the worst series in television history and you might have guessed this based on some things that i've written on the web page um, the worst series in television history is this one Is hope, fear, love. But for some, there is an all consuming darkness, an evil that cannot be contained. The person's compulsion to kill isn't written all over their face, it's in their mind. It's in their mind. That's where we go. Dare to join us? you to really think about the messages in that little promo that was a, a preseason promo from several years ago um, kind of after some cast changes and you know, trying to reinvigorate the series after it had been on for several years this was a long running television program with a great deal of popularity and it continues in syndication you can um, watch every episode of criminal minds in binge fashion and in fact the amount of viewership that criminal minds has now in the streaming environment has just persisted um, and with the pandemic has gotten even higher <laughs> so people are going back to this series repeatedly now what tends to happen in every episode of criminal minds is you have a person who is depicted as committing really graphically disturbing crimes um, often um, very bizarre sexually motivated crimes, um, graphically violent crimes uh, against victims who are often depicted as, as faultless um, or at least undeserving. About, you know, they get the call, they get to go in their fancy jet, which I'm guessing in real life FBI agents don't have a fancy jet and they probably don't look that good either. But they get the call, it's the big crime, they need to come, you know, help and solve the crime. So you get the start, they go to the scene, you get grossed out by just how bizarre the crime is. And then um, one of the characters who's depicted as a person who has, you know, this mutant smart uh, character who also has a psychology, psychiatry, neuroscience background. So not only is he uber smart, he also is the supplier in the plot line of the psychiatric labeling information for you as the viewer. And it's usually about you know midway through the episode that Spencer kind of provides you with the diagnostic profile um, and often will give you a family backstory for the murderer that involves things like adoption, abuse, neglect um, and, and various other adverse childhood experiences um, and then you know they, they, they catch the bad person um, frequently the bad person ends up dead um, and doing various bad things along the way 
the worst season of television that I've seen, and this is another, not quite as long-running as Criminal Minds, certainly, but a long-running long franchise is this one. October 17th. Here you will repent for your sins to the only judge that matters. Enter the asylum. For a terrifying detail of fear, lust, and insanity. American Horror Story Asylum, Wednesday, October 17th at 10, only on FX. So in American Horror Story, this particular version, I mean, they, they change up with the American Horror Story franchise. They change up the context, like there's the carnival version, there's the hotel version. This one was the asylum version. And given that it's a horror story, they want to scare you, they want to gross you out. Um, so they pick the asylum context as a place for the very bizarre, very terrifying, very horrible things to happen. And pretty much every asylum-related stereotype and every mental illness-related stereotype and every psychiatrist-related stereotype that you can imagine showed up during that season of television. While there are some positive images, and you can find them, they're just hard to find, um, most of these po positive images, um, the exception, I think, would be Canvas, which is positive and accurate, most of the others, they have their moments of accuracy, they have their moments of positive impact, but most of the positive images come with um, a problematic piece. Um, and we'll be watching Beautiful Mind at the end of the semester, we'll be watching Silver Lining's Playbook in the middle of the semester, uh, well, closer to the beginning, um, and you'll see what I call positive but not particularly accurate depictions. So you have the, the asset of positive exposure, but the problem of not really being educationally um, accurate. While there are positive images, every time you turn around, you get a really popular, really successful, really powerful batch of negative imagery. Uh, and 2019's Joker is certainly an example there. As I said, there are pros and cons. When you get these positive examples, they can have a good effect. You can have more conversation, more positive uh, discourse, more public awareness. Um, and that's been seen in programs when they depict characters with obsessive compulsive disorder and do so fairly accurately. It can increase the level of comment if you have a bipolar character on a show, it can increase the, the level of public education that surrounds that display. That kind of discourse can be shown, and it's been shown education in, in research, that people can uh, exhibit decreased prejudice and discrimination as a result of positive media. Um, and that can also then trickle down to making it more likely that people, when they are in crisis, will seek treatment for themselves or for their families. What are the impacts of the bad media and of inaccurate media? Um, well, anytime you have these inaccurate, negative depictions, what people walk away with is misinformation. Um, I've had students as recently as last fall say, I never knew that multiple personality or dissociative identity disorder and schizophrenia were different things. They're different things, in case you still thought that was true. And the reason why? Because films so often com conflate the two and mix them together. Um, it's very, very subtle, but it shows up in, in Joker. We'll, we'll see it there. These negative images, these negative messages increase our adherence to stigmatizing beliefs and that in turn can lead people to avoid seeking treatment. You know, you may personally know what your mental illness is and understand it, know that you don't deserve the negative stigmatizing beliefs that surround it, but the fact that the people around you have those beliefs, it may mean that you have to hide 
that you are afraid to seek treatment for being labeled. Um, and, and all of that is bad in terms of family members supporting their loved ones when they have mental illness and for people themselves to get the right treatment that they need. So like with um, 2019's Joker, these problematic images continue to persist. And sometimes students say, yeah, but really, what are the negative impacts? I love television, and so do I, and I love movies. And I don't know what it is with me, but it, the more criminal activity is in it, the better I like it. But there are real world consequences. And here's one simple example. Major concerns tonight that the new neighbors might be hundreds of mental patients. A company wants to build a huge mental hospital in Titusville in a spot that has homes and businesses nearby. New tonight, West Hughes' Dan Billow is live in Titusville. And Dan, how close would it be to homes? Well, Jim, uh, quite a few people like those living right here will look right over their back fences at what now is an abandoned motel, but what could be the home permanently of 200 mentally ill people. Well, it's like right there. Next like month, right the Titusville City Council will vote on whether this old building should be turned into a residential treatment facility for mentally ill people, one of the largest centers of its kind in Central Florida. That's a little too close to my house to have that kind of crap. What would you be concerned about? Uh, violence. Backers of the project say the residents' concerns are misplaced. I don't think there's any danger to the neighborhood. I think that there is a lot of stigma that's attached to the mentally ill. The president of the company that wants to open the treatment center says it would be a psychiatric resort, lavishly landscaped, providing 100 jobs with a $4 million payroll. It would house patients with disorders such as depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia, whose families would pay up to $16,000 a month. As is, the place is an eyesore. We have constant homeless people on the premises. Some residents say the resort-style layout just isn't secure enough. Usually a mental institution is all inside, you know, where the rooms are all inside, where they can control it. Backers have an uphill battle in this thing. Planners at City Hall say this is not the right kind of neighborhood for a treatment center like that. Residents don't like it either. Everyone will have their say at a public hearing on April 22nd. We're live in Titusville, Brevard County. Dan Billow, West 2 News. Now, before you think that's just something that happens in Florida, this is the kind of thing that happens in uh, neighborhoods all across the country when um, mental health uh, organizations attempt to create facilities to provide local uh, services to people with mental illnesses, particularly people with serious mental illness who need um, the, the benefit of inpatient care, um, they, they frequently run into community backlash that is informed by the, the misinformation that comes from mass media uh, fictional portrayals of people. So go back to the very beginning of this presentation where I said that most people get their knowledge, their awareness of mental illness and, uh, and treatment, they get that knowledge from film and television, from fiction, um, and the information is largely inaccurate and negative. As a result, when they hear that you're going to put a hospital or a treatment facility in their, their neighborhood, in their area, the tendency is for there to be intense and very vociferous backlash. So what is the impact of mass media exposure to these kinds of messages? Well, primarily, people tend to, even if they don't notice that they're doing it, they tend to absorb and then spread incorrect information. Um, I've had lots of these conversations since I started teaching this class in 2004, and it is an uphill battle to, to try and convince people that what they've seen is in fact not accurate. What people develop as a result of absorbing these messages is very strongly held prejudiced attitudes. Um, if you saw from the people being interviewed on that news clip, they believe that people with mental illness are dangerous. 
they're, they believe that people with mental illness are unpredictable. They believe that they are deserving of being locked up and controlled. And that is the practice of discrimination. So in short, that's what stigma is. And we'll come back in part two and I'll lay out for you what I call a social cognitive model of that stigma process.